Um, I will talk about the cake sort pro problem, as uh, you know, the slide is, in, is uh, indicating. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me. It's very uh, nice to be here, and I, I'm very uh, glad uh, to be speaking. Um, so, okay, so um, I'll talk about the cake sort problem. And the first thing uh, is to, of course, define the, the problem formally. Uh, so the problem basically has three par parameters. Uh, K, M, and N, and uh, it's defined as follows. So we're given Oracle access to uh, K functions, which we assume to be uh, selected uniformly at random, um, F1 up to FK. So uh, the domain size of the function is, uh, of each function is M bits. The range size is N bits. And we're given a target uh, T of N bits. And uh, the goal is basically to find a k-tuple uh, of inputs to each function such that f1 uh, applied to x1, xor f2 applied to x2, uh, up to fk applied to xk equals the target t. Okay, so that's basically uh, the cake sort problem. Um, that's the uh, definition. Uh, I should say that there are several variants of the problem. Uh, um, sometimes you define it with a single list, uh, with a single function. Uh, there are several variants. This is the kind of variant that has the most applications in the cryptography, and this is why I'm uh, defining uh, it this way. Okay, so uh, let me just, uh, you know, emphasize a few points about this uh, definition. Uh, so, uh, first, I, uh, you know, the, the definition talks about a random function. So, what is a random function? A random function, basically, uh, you think about, about it, uh, like each one of these is a random function. So, uh, for each function independently, for each input, basically, you select the, uh, uh, the n bit output independently of everything. Okay, so that's what it means to be a random function. And uh, we'll talk about algorithms uh, for this uh, problem. Obviously, that's what we're, we'll be interested in. And uh, um, basically, we want uh, algorithms that succeed with uh, high probability. Um, or what I mean by high probability, usually it's some constant. OK, we're not going to care really much about constant. Uh, you can think about uh, success probability of half uh, or one third. That's, uh, I mean, that's good enough for us. Okay, the success uh, probability is taken over, like the, the algorithms could be uh, randomized, but actually we won't uh, talk about randomized algorithms. We'll just see deterministic algorithms. So, but if they are randomized, the success probability is taken over the random choices of the algorithm and over the random choice of the, the functions, F1 up to Fk, okay? Uh, so that's uh, another comment and uh, another Assumption that uh, we're going to make that's uh, not written explicitly in the definition is that uh, k is going to be a small constant. Okay, like two, three, four, or whatever. Um, on the other end, we'll think of the other parameters like m and n, which are the domain and range sizes of the, of the functions, where we think about them as like growing to infinity uh, many times. Okay, uh, so that's uh, uh, about the uh, parameters. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so uh, this problem, uh, you might recognize it, uh, I don't know, depends on what uh, type of, uh, you know, uh, algorithms you're interested in. You might recognize a kind of a re related problem, which is known as k-sum. Uh, the k-sum is basically a similar problem, but uh, the main difference is that the addition here, instead of, uh, you know, being just uh, XOR, uh, it's, it's defined over some uh, abelian group, uh, typically uh, over ZN. Um, so the reason, like I could have talked about also uh, KSUM and so forth, uh, the techniques are actually quite related. I mean, the algorithms and techniques um, used uh, for solving these problems are related. And many, the uh, many of the techniques that I'll uh, talk about can actually be generalized uh, to KSOM. Uh, so the reason I, you know, I want to focus on KXOR is that uh, the applications I'll talk about are, uh, are for KXOR, okay? Uh, but again, if you're interested in KSOM, then most of the techniques uh, still apply. Uh, 
Okay, so why, why, uh, why is this problem interesting? So uh, this is kind of a, you know, a, a school in uh, cryptography, so we're interested basically in you know, uh, uh, problems that uh, have some kind of relation to, uh, to cryptography. So uh, the, the algorithms and techniques that I'll discuss are actually uh, uh, widely applicable to uh, uh, usually in cryptanalysis of uh, many crypto systems. So uh, I'm talking about the techniques now, not necessarily the algorithms for the K, uh, specific K or problem that I, de I define, but in general, the algorithms that, or techniques that I'll define are applicable in cryptanalysis of uh, symmetric uh, key crypto systems. And we'll see uh, specific uh, examples of that. Uh, they're also applicable, I mean, variants of the techniques are also applicable for solving the learning parity with noise problem, which has a lot of applications in, uh, in cryptography. Um, they're also, uh, I mean, the techniques are also uh, useful in cryptanalysis of uh, code-based crypto systems. And uh, furthermore, in uh, crypto system based on LWE and uh, lattice-based uh, crypto systems. Um, the techniques are also useful in uh, side channel uh, attacks on uh, some public key crypto systems like uh, ECDSA. And uh, as I already mentioned, there are also, I mean, the, the techniques and algorithms are also useful for solving uh, uh, subset sum problems or k sum problems uh, in general. Okay, and uh, there are additional kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, applications that I did not list here. So there are, in general, the, the algorithms and techniques uh, are useful in many different settings as, uh, as listed here. So I think it's kind of... Uh, uh, useful to, to know about them, okay? Uh, that's the kind of the basic motivation. Okay, so uh, the general plan uh, for actually this morning and I have another talk in the afternoon. So I'm going to describe to you the state of the art algorithms uh, for KXOR in various uh, settings. So we have like three parameters, K, uh, M, and N, and I'll try to describe to you what is the state of the art uh, for algorithms for the cakes or uh, problems in uh, various settings. And I actually focus on, uh, on the smaller var values of K, two, three, and four. And we'll say that the, this var uh, for, uh, even for this uh, you know, uh, restricted uh, and small values of K, uh, there can be some uh, non-trivial algorithms. And actually when you uh, look at larger Ks, um, the techniques kind of generalize, okay? So actually most of the time or, almost, or maybe even all of the time, I'll talk about small values of K. Um, but again, uh, uh, the most interesting, I mean, not all, but most of the interesting techniques can already be, uh, are already, already useful for uh, these small uh, parameter values. Um, okay, and uh, I'll describe uh, applications uh, to uh, symmetric uh, quick uh, cryptanalysis. And actually, uh, um, I'll focus on very specific crypto systems, uh, which, is, uh, which are two ciphers, uh, GA1 and GEA2. Um, so these are ciphers that uh, uh, have been used in the, in the past uh, in order to, uh, to encrypt uh, mo mobi mobile uh, data. I'll talk about it, I mean, in detail when... Uh, uh, like in uh, an hour or so, but uh, in general, these are ciphers that were widely used at least once. So I think it's very nice to see like applications of the, these uh, uh, algorithms and cryptanalysis of you know ciphers that were used in practice. I mean, it's not it's not obvious uh, that you can uh, uh, I mean just apply general algorithms and cryptanalysis of you know of uh, uh, practical ciphers. I mean, if I, if I for example were to uh, talk about cryptanalysis of classical ciphers like uh, DES or AES, then I would kind of need to, uh, uh, to show you very specific techniques. I will have to kind of dive into the S boxes and the linear layers and everything. And everything is going to be quite uh, specific. But here I think it's quite nice that, uh, I mean, you can um, kind of uh, discuss general algorithms for KXOR and then uh, show how to apply, uh, apply them, uh, I mean, in, the, in a general, in generally at a high level to, uh, to uh, you know, to a modern crypto system. Okay, the, I think that's kind of uh, nice and uh, we'll see how it's done. And uh, another part of uh, the talk, which I'll uh, get to this afternoon, 
is that uh, I'll talk about a relatively recent result that uh, kind of establishes relations between the variants of the KXOR problem. So I think this, uh, this part is kind of, uh, uh, I would say, the focus here is kind of different from the other two parts uh, because it's, uh, it, it actually combines several, it's in the intersection of several uh, areas like provable security, cryptanalysis, uh, uh, fine-grained uh, complexity, and so, so there are many things going on there, and I think it's kind of uh, interesting to, uh, to you know, uh, th this kind of interesting result that uh, uh, I'll discuss uh, this afternoon. Okay, so uh, um, th that's kind of the, the general plan, so uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start. Uh, so I'll start obviously with the basic algorithms for uh, KXOR. Um, so, uh, actually, before we we'll talk about algorithms, uh, let's uh, talk about conventions. So, here's the KXOR problem, as I already defined, and uh, we'll talk about algorithms, and we'll, uh, the main resources that we'll be interested in are, obviously, the time uh, complexity of the algorithm, which we'll denote by uh, T, and the space complexity, or memory complexity of the algorithm, which we'll denote by S. Okay, so these are the main resources that we'll uh, be interested in. And uh, the, obviously, the algorithms and the complexity of the algorithms will vary according to the parameters, like the k, n, and, and m. Uh, again, uh, k is the number of functions, m is the uh, domain size, uh, actually log of the domain size, and n is the log of the range size of the functions. And actually, usually, the domain size the m is going to be a function of k and n, but in general, it can be a parameter. Okay, the complexity of the algorithms is going to be exponential in n. Okay, in the, uh, in the uh, log of the range size, basically. Um, and uh, we'll actually ignore polynomial factors in n in the, uh, when we analyze the algorithms in terms of times and space. And this is actually not, uh, not an obvious choice, I have to admit. Uh, for example, for k equals 3, for 3xor and 3sum, uh, there, are, there is a long line of work that actually tries to optimize these, uh, these polynomial factors, but uh, I have limited the amount of time, so I won't be able to, uh, uh, to really talk about these algorithms uh, uh, here, but uh, um, um, they exist, uh, but I have to say in advance that I'm going to ignore these polynomial factors in it. Uh, one last thing is that the analysis is generally going to be a, a heuristic, um, just for simplicity, I mean, uh, uh, if you try to analyze all the algorithms rigorously, I mean, usually you can do it, and it's not very difficult, actually. Um, but uh, we'll have to, uh, you know, again, I have to, I want to cover, uh, you know, a bit more material, so I have to, uh, uh, to do the analysis heuristically. But again, it can be generalized by uh, uh, re relatively standard techniques. Uh, I mean, it can be made rigorous by re uh, relatively standard techniques. Okay, um, so let's again examine the KXOR problem and let's make a first uh, simplification. So the first simplification that I'm going to make is that I'm going to assume without loss of generality that uh, the target here is equal to zero. Um, and why, you ca why can you do that? Well, basically there is a simple reduction that uh, shows that if you can solve the problem with target zero, you can solve it uh, um, with uh, the same basically time and space uh, for any target t. And the reduction goes as follows. So you def just define the function g1, uh, which is basically f1 xor t. Okay, and then you solve the problem, the k xor problem, not with f1 up to f fk, but with g1 uh, f2 up to fk, and you solve it with a target of zero. Okay, and, uh, and you can see that any solution to this problem, uh, the k xor problem with these functions, uh, if you solve it, then you actually get, uh, uh, if you just, uh, you know, plug in here g1 equals f1 xor t, you, you see that you get a, a k sum uh, that, uh, sorry, a k xor that solves the, uh, the problem with the target of t. Okay, so uh, I can assume without loss of generality that uh, t equals uh, zero. Okay, so here's the simplified uh, version of KXOR where the, you, you have no target and, and basically you're looking for a KXOR that is uh, equal to zero. Any questions so far?
Okay, so um, let's talk about solutions to KXR. So the, uh, the I mean, the solution space, uh, the size of the solution space is basically you're talking about all K tuples here. Uh, so what's the number of K tuples? It's two to the M times K, right? Because uh, every function, the domain size is two to the M and you have K functions. So basically that's the, um, the solution space size. And the expected number of solutions you can uh, formalize this and you can do this, this rigorously. Maybe I'll do it at the end if I have time, but uh, you can show it's not very uh, difficult that the expected number of solutions to the problem is two to the m times k, uh, which is basically the number of k tuples times uh, two to the minus n. This is basically because every k tuple uh, solves the problem, like it's uh, uh, the XOR of the functions applied to the k tuple, is equal to zero with probability two to the minus n, so that's the expected number of solutions, two to, uh, to the m times k minus n. Okay, so uh, and for this, you can see that if m is, e is much smaller than n over k, then uh, you have no solutions with high probability. Okay, and this just follows from a uh, you know, uh, basic mark of inequality. Um, basically, if m is much smaller than n over k, then uh, you can see that the expected number of solutions is very small, and, and therefore, uh, I mean, just by Markov's inequality, the probability of an instance having a solution is very small. So in this case, this, this, is, this problem is just not very interesting. I mean, you're looking for algorithms to solve the problem, but there is no solution. So it's not interesting. Uh, so the regime that we'll interest, be interested in is uh, when m is at least n over k, so solution uh, exists. I mean. Okay, so the expected number of solutions in this case is uh, at least one. It uh, depends on the value of m. Uh, and you can show that the solution actually exists with high probability. And for this, uh, you actually need to, uh, to, to derive, uh, uh, you know, to look at the higher moments of the random variable that defines the number of solutions for the problem. You need to, uh, to, to basically obtain a tail bound. And for this, you need to calculate the higher moments of this random variable. And like I said, I'll do it formally at the end if I have time, but in general, it's not very difficult to do. And you can show that if the expected number of solutions is, say, at least one, then with high probability, there actually exists a solution. Okay? Okay, so we'll start by focusing on, on, the, uh, on the specific setting of m equals n over k, in which case you have... Uh, the expected number of solutions is exactly one. So there is, uh, on average, one solution. And like I said, uh, with high probability, there actually is a solution. Okay, and uh, the information theoretic lower bound, uh, like um, if you kind of uh, start to evaluate these functions, I mean, you're not going to see a solution. I mean, uh, unless you, uh, you kind of... Uh, Evaluate the function in roughly two to the n over k uh, inputs, right? Uh, otherwise, you just uh, if you look at all the k tuples that you evaluated with high probability, you're not going to even see a solution. So there's a, a simple information theoretic lower bound, just a query complexity for these functions. It's two to the n over k. Okay, you cannot do better than this. Th that's kind of obvious. Okay, so let's start with the kind of most basic uh, um, variant of the problem that you can think of. Uh, this is basically two XOR. So uh, K is equal to two. And uh, like I said, we'll focus, start by focusing on the single solution regime where M is equal to N over two. Okay, so this is basically the uh, two XOR problem where you have just uh, two functions and we're looking for just for a uh, a uh, couple of inputs, uh, F1, uh, x1 of x2, such that f1 applied to x1, or f2 applied to x2, is equal to zero. Okay, so the most basic algorithm that you can take of is basically exhaustive search, right? Uh, so what was, uh, is exhaustive search? You just uh, enumerate over all these pairs. Uh, for each pair, you check this condition, f1 of x1, or f2 uh, applied to x2 uh, is equal to zero. And if you find uh, a pair, then uh, you find a solution. Uh, I mean, that's exhaustive search. Uh, kind of the most trivial algorithm. The complexity is, uh, is 2 to the n, right? That's the, uh, the expected complexity is roughly 2 to the n. That's the uh, size of the uh, domain of these two functions. And uh, you're not using, basically, 
the space that you, you, you're using is, is really negligible. You're not using any space. Okay, any questions so far? So I, I'm not going to discuss, uh, like I said, I'm going to ignore polynomial factors in N, so it's polynomial in N. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's uh, N squared or something like that, but uh, it's polynomial. So it's, uh, in, in, like in my language, it's, uh, it's negligible, okay? Okay, so the first uh, kind of uh, algorithm, uh, I mean, maybe a bit non-trivial that we'll see is, uh, is how to do better than, uh, at, le at least in terms of time complexity. And we're going to pay, uh, pay here by uh, using m more memory. Okay, so that's the, um, what I'm going to call the basic algorithm uh, for Tuxar. We'll see later that it kind of generalizes to any, uh, to cakes or for any k. Okay, so it's uh, basically a meet, uh, called the meet in the middle or sort and match algorithm. Um, so basically the, uh, the idea is to look for x1 and x2 such that f1 of x1 is equal to uh, f2 uh, applied to x2. And uh, obviously uh, this, uh, this is equivalent to finding uh, uh, Tuxor, okay? Obviously the, this is the same. Okay, so how does the algorithm work? So uh, I'll try to do it on the board. I mean, this is kind of very basic, but uh, um, later it will generalize, but uh, I want to kind of go through the steps slowly. So basically we have here two functions, like uh, F1. Okay, and the size of the uh, domain of the function is uh, two to the N over two. And uh, F2. Uh, again, was domain size uh, 2 to the n over 2. Okay, and what we'll do is just uh, the first thing that we'll do is the, uh, evaluate f1 over all inputs and just uh, build a table. Okay, so we're going to build a table, and how does the table, how is the table going to look like? Well, it will have uh, all inputs x1 uh, next to f1 applied to x1. Okay, so this is a table of size two to the n over two. Okay, and we're going to sort it by, uh, by this column. Okay, so we'll just build a sorted table for uh, F1. Okay, and, uh, and now what uh, we can do, we can uh, evaluate F2 at each point, at each X2, and we're just going to, uh, uh, to do a search for this table, and we can do a search it kind of efficiently, uh, I don't know, in time n or something like that, but we'll ignore that because it's polynomial in n. Uh, and for each, uh, for each value of uh, um, x2, we'll compute uh, uh, f2 of x2 and just uh, search this table. And if we find a match, like, uh, like there's some value here, that's equal to this uh, value here, then we solve the, the problem, right? So that's, uh, that's basically the algorithm that's, uh, that's written here. And uh, that's called the beat in the middle algorithm or sort and match. Um, so what, what, uh, what is the complexity of the algorithm? Well, the, okay, the time complexity here I mean, the time complexity of each step, like building a table, is, uh, is 2 to the n over 2. And that's also the time complexity of uh, evaluating this function and searching the table. Basically, for each input for f2, the time complexity is roughly 1. So uh, the total time complexity is 2 to the n over 2. And uh, what is the space complexity? Well, it's also 2 to the n over 2, because uh, this is the size of the table that we built here. Okay. Actually, there's another variant of the algorithm, maybe a more symmetrical variant that you can do. I mean, in this case, it's not going to matter, but in general, it can matter. I mean, you could, you could build another table here for F2. It's kind of symmetric to what you do with F1. So you build a table for F2, like for all the inputs. And you sort it by, again, this column. And then you kind of do a merge sort. You're looking for a collision between these values and these values. And because they're sorted, you can uh, do it in a linear time and to the, to the n over 2. OK? Uh, that's kind of a symmetric version of the, of the algorithm. But uh, 
In terms of uh, time complexity and space complexity, this remains the same. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so this is kind of the basic uh, algorithm that I'll discuss, and sometimes I'll call it a merge operation. So we're kind of merging uh, F1 and F2 on the condition uh, on this, uh, on the condition that F2 of X2 is equal to F1 applied to X1. Okay, uh, th that's basically the operation that we're doing here. And as I said, the time and memory complexities are two to the n over two, and uh, the time complexity is optimal, right? Because we said that uh, you cannot do better than that. Uh, the time complexity for any cakes or algorithm, uh, the optimal, uh, just by the uh, you know, uh, information theoretic bound, is 2 to the n over k. And k here, k is equal, is equal to 2. So this is optimal. OK, and actually, um, the entire algorithm, I mean, this very simple algorithm, is essentially the best known uh, the, the best thing that you can do for these parameters. I mean, it's not even, it's not known how to get space uh, below to the, to the, the n over 2. And actually, uh, if you want to keep the time to, to the n over 2. And actually, it's a major open problem to, uh, uh, to do this. I mean, not, not, just in complex, uh, not just in cryptography, also in complexity theory. It's kind of related to a problem called the element distinctness. And uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's closely related. I mean, and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a... Big open problem. Uh, I mean, to uh, to uh, to reduce the space here substantially. Okay, for uh, but actually, I should say that when the domain size is larger than n over two, then you can actually um, do uh, you can actually do this. I mean, you can do uh, time which is uh, two to the n over two and uh, and obtain much uh, smaller space. And the techniques I'm not going to uh, to do this, but actually, Gaetan talked about this uh, last time. You can use some. Uh, Techniques uh, like cycle finding and parallel collision, collision search. So when the domain size is uh, larger, uh, you can, uh, th these techniques actually give you uh, a, a smaller amount of space. OK? Um, so yeah, so, uh, but, but for these parameters, uh, like uh, m equals n over 2, I mean, this, this simple algorithm is the, is the best known both in terms of time and space. For time, uh, we know it's actually optimal. Yes? Is there a lower bound? That on on like the space complexity? Yeah, to show that maybe you can do better? No. Uh, so <laughs> actually, the thing is, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not even, sh I mean, we don't even know how to prove something like this, like in terms of lower bound. You don't even know how to prove that there is no algorithm that with time equals n over 2 and s, uh, equals like 2 to the epsilon n for any epsilon uh, greater than 0. We don't even know how to prove things like this. We don't even, even know how to do, how to prove that uh, with optimal time complexity, you need uh, non-negligible sp uh, space. It could be, I mean, theoretically, that you can solve this optim in optimal time and spa in negli negligible space, but we don't know how to... Uh, we don't, we don't know, basically, for this type of problems, we don't know how to prove anything non-trivial about space complexity. OK, yeah, so that, these are uh, uh, also like kind of major open problems in complexity theory. I mean, if you can prove uh, something like this, that you need the, like 2 to the, I don't know, uh, n over 100 space uh, to solve this in this time, I mean, it would be kind of a major result. Like, uh, People have been trying, struggling with this problem for like 50 years or so. So it's really major. Um, OK. No, that, it's not true, actually. You can do, you can do uh, for example, using cycle finding techniques, you can do t equals 2, um, I think, 3n divided by 4, and s uh, negligible. This you can do with cycle finding techniques. So there, there's a non-trivial trade-off. Again, uh, like parallel collision, collision search gives you these kinds of, these, uh, kinds of trade-offs. Uh, again, Gaito talked about this yesterday. You can uh, do variants of these uh, techniques to, uh, to get these trade-offs. These are non-trivial trade-offs. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to discuss them. OK? OK, so uh, that's. No. 
so, so like I said, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, insist on time like being something like this, uh, then you cannot even prove that you need space like this. The, okay? Uh, so, so you can basically anything interesting about the space complexity that we want to prove, you, we can do. We cannot do. Okay? <laughs> That's, uh, and again, it's a major open problem, not just for cakes or problems, for general problems in, uh, in P, which the, the output is, uh, is short. We don't know how to prove anything interesting about space. Okay? In, in a general model, uh, the, uh, it's important to emphasize here that the model is general. Like uh, the algorithm can, has uh, unlimited access to its input. Uh, and in this model, we don't know how to prove anything interesting about space. Uh, there are other models, like computational models, where like the streaming model or, or pebbling models or, or mo uh, models like this, where we do, where we do know how to prove uh, interesting lower bounds about space. But here we're not restricting the algorithm in any way. You can access the input in any way that it wants. And in this case, we don't know how to prove anything non trivial Okay. Okay, so I talked about uh, Tuxor. Uh, so let's uh, generalize the algorithm for KXOR. I mean, for K uh, larger than, uh, than two. And again, we're, we're talking about the single solution regime where M is equal to N over K. Okay, and well, we'll just see a variant of the basic algorithm that can be applied for any K equals uh, uh, greater or equal to two. Uh, so let's define uh, K prime is going to be K divided by two, uh, rounded down. Okay, that's uh, the definition of K prime. So basically, we're going to do the same algorithm uh, just by partitioning the functions into two groups. Okay, uh, the first group is going to con uh, consist of F1 up to FK prime. So that's roughly half the functions. Okay, it depends if, uh, on whether K is even or not. Okay, so if k is even, basically we're partitioning them uh, equally. And if not, uh, then uh, it's slightly less than half the function. Uh, basically, for each uh, k prime tuple, uh, we build a table like, uh, uh, like I showed you here, just for uh, the uh, k prime tuple. So we, we, next to x1 up to x uh, k prime, uh, we, we evaluate F1 up to X1, uh, XOR up to FK prime, uh, applied to K X prime. Okay, and we do this in the sorted table. And then uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, second group of functions, we just look into this table. I mean, we evaluate uh, the remainder, the, the remaining group. I mean, for each uh, uh, tuple of the remaining group, X uh, K prime plus one up to X uh, K. Okay, for each uh, uh, of these tuples, we just calculate this, uh, this, this XOR. Okay, F uh, K prime uh, plus one up to F uh, K. We, we calculate this XOR and we look into this, uh, this table. Okay, and uh, basically we're trying to find a match like this. Okay, and a match like this immediately gives you K XOR. Okay, uh, so that's a very, uh, Simple and uh, natural ge generalizations of the Tuxor algorithm, the, or meter the middle algorithm that I uh, just uh, described. Okay, so again, uh, just, this is just a merge operation. So we're merging the first group of functions with the second group of functions on, on this condition. Okay, this is the condition that we're checking in the table, which is equal to equivalent to the KXOR condition. Okay, what, what is the complexity? Well, if, if k is even, then the functions are, uh, you know, uh, th then the groups are of the, of the same size. It's k over two, exactly. Okay, and then the complexity is, uh, is again, two to the n over two. Okay, it's two to the, uh, basically, m times k prime, uh, but uh, m here, remember, is n over k, and uh, k is, uh, uh, sorry, and k prime is k over two, so basically you get, two to the n over two again, and s equals two to the n over two. Okay, you get essentially the same thing that we had for Tuxor. Uh, we just generalize it for Kxor. Uh, it's okay, we, did, uh, we didn't do anything really special here. Uh, and if k is odd, then the, the groups are not of the same size. So you get, uh, so uh, 
if you look at the space here, then the space is, uh, I mean, the, this first group, uh, uh, I mean, it's of size k prime. It's a bit less than k over 2. So the space, the table that you're building, is of size 2 to the n over 2 minus uh, some left over here. It's n over uh, 2k. I mean, uh, you can do this. Uh, I mean, it's basically. I mean, the size of the table here is, a, is 2 to the uh, m times uh, k prime, right? Th th this is uh, the number of functions uh, uh, that we have. It's k prime, which, which is 2 to the m is like n over k, right? And k prime is uh, k, uh, it's k over 2, but k is odd. So it's k minus 1 divided by 2, OK? And, uh, and this is basically. Uh, 2 to the n over k uh, times uh, k over 2 uh, times uh, 2 to the, 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 the half here, I mean the minus half here gives you 2 to the n over 2k and this is equal to 2 to the uh, n over 2 times, uh, it's minus here of course, uh, yeah so it's minus n over 2k. Okay, this is basically what's written here, and uh, yeah. Okay, and, uh, and this simple algorithm is already the best known uh, in terms of time complexity. I mean, you cannot do better. We don't know how to do better. I mean, not only for k equals 2 in terms of time complexity. We don't know how to do better for any constant k. So uh, for large k, I mean, if, if k is not constant, like uh, if, it's, uh, uh, if, if it depends on n, if it grows with n, then we do know how to do better. For example, if k equals n or k equals n over 2, you can just do it with li linear algebra. I'm not going to do it, but uh, can be the, I mean, you can solve it actually in polynomial time. Uh, but if k is constant, we don't, uh, we don't know how to do uh, much better in terms of time complexity. Okay, so let's see the, let's talk about the summary so far. Okay, we talked about kind of very, very basic algorithms uh, for the KXOR problem. Okay, so the basic algorithm uh, that I just showed you, showed you for K even, we get uh, T equals 2 to the N over 2 and S equals 2 to the N over 2. Uh, for K odd, we get 2 to the N over 2 plus uh, some uh, leftover N uh, divided by 2k, and the space is uh, n o, uh, 2 to the n uh, uh, divided by 2 minus n uh, over 2k. OK, so the time complexity is the best known for any constant k. And uh, uh, the time and space complexity are the best known for uh, k equals 2. The information theoretic lower bound is 2 to the n over k, and uh, it's only matched, obviously, for k equals 2. OK, for k, as k goes bigger, uh, we still don't know how to do better than roughly 2 to the n over 2, or this le oh, 2 to the n over 2 plus this leftover. Uh, we don't know how to do better than this, but the information theoretic lower bound, it kind of uh, drops sharply with k, right? But we, uh, even though, um, this uh, lower bound uh, drops sharply. We don't really know how to do uh, much better than this basic algorithm that I just described. OK? Yes? Um, maybe I'm confusing things, but Wagner's Sorry? Uh, maybe confusing things, but Wagner's algorithm doesn't help here. Sorry? Wagner's. Uh, so I'm talking about m equals n over k. Wagner's algorithm uh, applies when uh, m is larger than n over k. Oh, okay. okay, so right. that, that's an uh, that's, uh, important constraint here, okay? So I'm talking about the single solution regime, okay? You have a single solution on average, so Wagner's algorithm is not going to, uh, to do anything here. I mean, All it's right. applicable only where, when there are more solutions. Okay, and that, that's actually uh, the interesting things that I'll talk about next. I mean, the, so next uh, I'll focus, so, so what's left to do here? Right? Like. Uh, I talked about all these things and uh, in many different regimes, the basic algorithm is the best of, that we can do. So what's left to talk about here? Um, so I'll talk about basically two regimes. Uh, the first is we'll keep the m equals n over k for, and, and we'll talk about k larger than two. 
And we'll try to optimize the space complexity while keeping the best known time complexity. So the best known time, time complexity is going to, like, uh, like I said, we don't know how to improve this for this regime. But uh, actually, we, uh, for k larger than 2, we do know how to obtain better space complexity. OK, that's one uh, thing that I'll talk about. And the second uh, thing that I'll talk about is to optimize the time complexity. But when m is larger than n over k, so the expected number of solutions is actually larger than 1. OK, in this case, you can, uh, do, uh, you can optimize the time complexity better than this, uh, this uh, uh, um, complexities that are obtained by the basic algorithm. OK, any, any questions? Yeah. So, so for example, like because this is also like you're computing a parity, and each of these function f i is a boolean function. Yeah. So, like, are there any algorithmic tools that use some like a Fourier representation of these boolean functions to come up with like faster algorithms? Uh, mm, not in the at least not in the regimes that I'll talk about. No, no not uh, not that I know of. Uh, okay. uh, so the answer is basically no. Uh, I mean, I'll talk about basic algorithms. They're, they're used like uh, um, maybe interesting, uh, you know, combinatorial techniques, but specifically for your analysis is not used in this type of, uh, for these type of, type okay. of algorithms. OK, thank you. More questions? OK. So let's, uh, I mean, uh, we talk about k over 2. Now let's talk about k over 3. Uh, what, what, what can we do with k over 3? OK, so let's again see a variant of the basic algorithm. Let's kind of specialize it for k, k over 3. Uh, so first, uh, let's talk about, uh, I mean, let's talk about the uh, 3 XOR specifically specialized on k over 3. So again, we're in the, spe uh, in the single solution regime, regime, m equals n over 3. So we're given access to 3 uh, random functions from uh, domain sizes n over 3, the range size is, uh, uh, I mean, the log uh, or the, uh, the input size is uh, n over 3 bits, the output size is n bits, and we want to find a triplet x1, x2, uh, x3 uh, um, of n over 3 uh, bit strings such that f1 applied to x1, XOR f2 applied to x2, XOR f3 applied to x2, x3 is equal to 0. Okay, that's uh, the problem. Okay, and, uh, and the basic algorithm, what does it do? It basically uh, builds a table for T1. Okay, so uh, we build a table for T1. The size of the table is 2 to the n over 3. And then we iterate over all, uh, over all uh, inputs in the domain of F2 and F3. There are 2 to the 2n over 3 such uh, uh, um, X2, uh, X3 values. And for each one, we just check this condition, F2 uh, applied to x2, XOR f3 applied to x3 is equal to f1 applied to x1. Okay, this is basically the right the, the uh, three XOR condition. And once we find the solution, I mean, once we find the match in this table, then uh, we output the, the three XOR. I mean, that's the, essentially the the basic algorithm that I uh, described uh, previously, specialized to k over th uh, to k equals uh, three. Any questions about the basic algorithm? OK, so this basic algorithm, I said uh, we, we cannot do better than two. Than, uh, OK, so uh, what are the time complexities uh, and memory complexity? So the time complexity is 2 to the 2n over 3, because it's dominated by kind of uh, iterating over all the uh, inputs in the domain of f2 and f3. So it's 2 to the 2n over 3. And the space complexity is, uh, is just building this table. So the size of the do domain size of the function f1 is f2 uh, to the n over 3. That's the uh, that's the space complexity of this table. Okay, so these, these are the parameters that, that we get. And like I said, we don't know how to improve the time complexity. And uh, again, it's a major open problem. Uh, but however, we can improve the space complexity, as I'll show you in, uh, shortly. Okay, like uh, it's an open problem to uh, improve T. And uh, we can actually improve S substantially. Uh, and uh, Kind of the observation for improving S, so w why can we improve S? Kind of uh, the main intuition here is that we'll talk, uh, let's look about, uh, let's uh, look into these 
two steps of uh, the, the algorithm. So the first step builds the table T1, and the second step kind of iterates over uh, the domains of F2 and F3. Um, so we can see that the steps are not balanced. And why they are not balanced? Uh, because the time complexity of the building the, uh, this T1 is 2 to the n over 3, and the space complexity is 2 to the n over 3. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the, the second step, the time complexity is 2 to the 2n over 3, and the space complexity here of iterating over uh, the, these domains is, is negligible. Okay, we're just doing exhaustive search here. So actually, we can try to balance these steps. We, we're going to spend more time on the kind of step one, and we're going to, to kind of use space in step two. Okay, you, you're going to use more space in step two, and we kind of get the same, we'll be able to get the same time complexity, but... Uh, reduce the memory complexity, okay? And for this, we'll kind of use a generic technique. Uh, it's called the clamp clamping through uh, pre-computation, or CTP. And uh, basically, it, it gives you a general time-space uh, trade-offs for uh, cakes or algor algorithms. So uh, the, the idea is kind of very simple. Again, the, there's not much going on here. Um, so we're given access to, so, assume that, so I'll, t I'll describe the general technique. So we're giving access to a function from, say, m bits to n bits. And one thing we, that we can do, and we've done this already, is just to build a search table uh, for the function, for the entire domain. OK, so we go through all uh, x's of the domain, uh, and we build the search table uh, sorted by this uh, f of x. And the time complexity is 2 to the m. The space complexity is 2 to the m. Okay, alternatively, let's uh, try to, I don't know, kind of uh, split this, uh, this uh, uh, the step into several steps, but build smaller tables for each step. Okay, and what, what uh, we're going to do is we're going to fix some parameter, tau, which is between 0 and m. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, iterate uh, on each output prefix. Uh, so let's call it uh, string t, so it will be just a tau bit string. Uh, and we're going to build the table uh, such that uh, it, for each uh, element in this table, uh, the f of x, uh, um, the prefix of tau bits of f of x is equal to this special t. Okay? So for each x in, uh, uh, input to this, this function, it's an m bit, we just check this condition. If the, we evaluate f on x, we check this condition, this prefix, if it's equal to t, we're just going to store it in this table. Okay? So what's the time complexity here? So uh, basically we're iterating over all prefixes. So the time complexity like of the iteration of this loop is 2 uh, to the tau. And for each one, we're iterating over the entire domain. So it's 2 to the m. So the time complexity increases kind of co if you compare this with this uh, uh, trivial step, the time complexity uh, is kind of larger. It's 2 to the tau plus m. And the space complexity, well, now the tables are smaller. Why are small by a factor of roughly? It's on average. Uh, they're smaller on average by a factor of 2 to the uh, tau. And why is that? Because uh, this is a tau bit condition. Kind of uh, you, uh, the probability that uh, random uh, f of x, like n bit string uh, f of x, uh, the, the probability that this uh, uh, that its prefix is equal to t is 2 to the minus tau. So the table is smaller. OK? Any questions about this uh, very simple uh, trade-off? Yes? Can't you just sort? Sorry? Can't you just sort to do this, to create this table? You, ca you can, but uh, the thing is that the space is smaller. I, wa I, want, to, I want to use smaller space. I mean, uh, it, you can. Uh, you, you can build a large table and sort it, but, uh, but the, this will cost you space complexity of 2 to the m. And I want to reduce the space complexity. I want it to be smaller than 2 to the m. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of thinking of this table. I, 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 don't want to, uh, I don't want to build this large table. I want, I want only a small table. And the, all the elements in this table, all the uh, like, uh, strings in this table have the uh, have the condition that uh, their tau bit uh, prefix is equal to this t. So I'm iterating over all t's, and for each t, I build this uh, smaller table. So you think, think of it as partitioning kind of the large table into smaller tables. 
Yes. Sorry? You re yes, I reuse the space, obviously. I'm, uh, okay, so maybe it's not, it's, it's obvious to me, but maybe, yeah, I should have said it explicitly. I'm re reusing the space. I, I like to build. Okay, so the domain size here is 2 to the m, and I'm building a table on the condition that's written here, f of x, I mean uh, prefix uh, tau, uh, is equal to t. So I'm iterating, I'm doing this for, for each t, uh, which is a, a tau bit string. Uh, okay. And for each... Uh, okay, so I'm only inserting like values of uh, f of x with uh, this condition. Okay, so the, the size of this table, I mean, the expected size is going to be 2 to the m uh, minus tau. Okay, because the probability of, uh, of any x having this, uh, I mean, its prefix of f of x uh, equal to t is basically 2 to the minus tau. Okay, so, and, and I'm doing this for every t, but yeah, I'm, I'm re reusing the space. That's the, that's the thing here. I'm, I'm, I mean, for each t, like I'm, I'm, I'm processing uh, like each t, and then I'm, uh, uh, you think of it as erasing this table and rewriting it with another table for the next t. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Okay. No, uh, so so it's a technique. It's not a problem. I let, uh, so now I will show you how to do this to optimize the space complexity of three crystal. Okay, it's not a problem yet. I mean. Okay, any other questions? Yes. So, so I was wondering, can you um, reduce the space complexity even further by not storing the prefix because it's known? So, sorry, or? can you speak a bit louder? I sorry, um, I was wondering if you could reduce the space complexity of the table even further by not storing the prefix because it's the same for all of them. But I guess if you're reusing the table, you need to... Yeah, yeah, um, uh, you, you don't need to store a prefix, but even if I store it, it, uh, it only saves me a small amount of space. Like, uh, I don't know, it will save me less than half of sp the space, but I'm ignoring these factors. I mean, it's not a, uh, maybe you can save it, I mean, you can do it with, uh, I don't know, uh, like uh, half of this, or maybe there are some functions of n here, but I'm ignoring these functions. I'm only interested in like the, like this main, uh, you know, main term here. That makes sense, thanks. Any other question? Sorry, it's just a small logistical question. Is it possible to write on that board? Sorry? Is it possible to write on that oh, board? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, well, I won't do this again, but uh, yeah, next time I'll uh, try to remember. Okay, so now, now let's see how uh, to improve the space complexity of uh, Twixor. And actually, it's quite surprising because this algorithm was only published in 2014 and not even in cryptography. It was published in a conference that deals with general algorithms, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, so let's do, uh, see how to do it. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll just, uh, okay. I'll just write it on the board. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do we have this, these uh, three functions, f1, uh, f2, and f3. Okay, so the domain size is again 2 to the n over 3, uh, 2 to the n over 3, and 2 to the n over 3. And now what we'll do, we'll, uh, I mean, here it's written already with parameters, but I want to do it in general. Okay, so let's fix, uh, uh, let's assume, uh, uh, fix just uh, um, T1 and T2, they're, they're, they're uh, prefixes of uh, size uh, tau bits. So t tau is going to be a parameter and I'm going to optimize it, okay? Uh, so what we'll do is the following. We'll use the, we'll iterate over all 
T1 and T2, but uh, let's assume that they're fixed for now. Okay, let's assume that they're fixed. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a table for F1. Okay, and the condition is going to be uh, F1 applied to X1 uh, is equal to uh, T1 uh, with prefix of uh, length tau bits. Okay, so the size of the table, it's going to be, well, it's going to be uh, 2 to the n over 3 uh, minus tau. Right, and uh, actually uh, what we'll do, we'll do the same for each function. F2 applied to X2, uh, prefix of tau is equal to T2. So again, we'll build this table. Uh, size 2 to the n over 3 uh, minus tau. Okay, and here, actually, we're using the fact that we're, we're trying to compute uh, a threesome, a threesor, sorry. Okay, so, the, so note that if uh, we have a threesor, and the uh, like tau bit prefix of uh, F1 applied to X1 is equal to, two, uh, to T1, and the tau bit prefix of uh, 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 X2 is equal, it should be T2 here, uh, then the tau bit prefix of F3 applied to X3, it should be T1 XOR T2, right? It just follows from uh, this, uh, uh, this equality here. Okay, so we just need to fix two prefixes here, not, uh, not three. Okay, so, um, yeah, so here, I mean, the, the condition here is uh, F3 applied to X3 taking a tau bit prefix, it should equal uh, T1 XOR with T2. And now, and now uh, basically what, we, what we'll do is, is just, uh, you know, uh, apply a standard uh, three XOR algorithm to these, uh, uh, to these three tables, to these small three tables. Okay, we just look for a, a, a three XOR solution within these uh, smaller tables. That, that's, that's basically the algorithm. Okay, so you can see that we're iterating kind of the, over the entire search, search space here. Okay, because uh, uh, if we fix, like if you, if you think of a solution that's written on the board, then you, you just uh, look at the prefix of uh, F1 applied to, K, uh, to, uh, to X1. Uh, you just iterate over all these prefixes, over all these prefixes, and, uh, and write the, the prefix of the third function has to be T1, so T2. So we're just iterating over the entire domain like this. So if there is a function, if there is a three source solution, then we'll find it. You don't do recursion, right? So Sorry? it's not, not recursive, right? No, so you cannot do recursion yeah. because uh, these are actually tables. I, see. I mean, the, uh, and, I see. and here, uh, th these are like oh. functions, these are random oracles. They, these do not require space, so you cannot do recursion. Okay? okay. But let, let's uh, try to analyze this. What's the time complexity here? Um, so basically, we're iterating over all T1 and T2. So we have an outer loop of uh, uh, complexity uh, 2 to the tau times 2 to the tau. And what do we do uh, in, each, uh, in each loop? Well, building the tables, I mean, building each table, we just iterate over the domain of F1, over F2, and F3 uh, independently. So the time complexity for each uh, building each table is 2 to the n over 3. Okay, that's the size of uh, complexity of building these tables. And then the complexity of solving tricks or for these uh, three tables. Well, what is it? Uh, remember, we, we have already this table for... Uh, for F1, and we just uh, look at the uh, like cross product uh, uh, of, of all uh, tuples in here, and we search it in uh, F1, in, in, the, in, the, in this table. So the time complexity of, the, of just looking for the trick is 2 to the 
uh, n uh, over 3 minus tau uh, yeah, squared. So it's times 2 here. OK, now let's try to optimize over tau. So uh, basically, we want to minimize this expression, right? We want to minimize this expression. And it's minimized when these uh, two expressions are equal. So uh, basically, you have an equation a n over 3 is equal to uh, 2n over 3 uh, minus 2 tau. Right, and then uh, you get uh, tau is equal to n over 6. OK? And what's the time complexity? Well, the time complexity is, uh, is uh, total time complexity. It's 2 to the 2 tau because of this outer loop. And here, uh, I mean, because these two are equal, these two are equal to, two, uh, to the n over 3. So it's uh, times 2 to the n over 3. And tau is equal to n over 6, so it's 2 to the 2 n over 3. That's the time complexity. And the space complexity, well, it's just building these tables. It's, uh, it's just these, these tables. It's 2 to the n over 3 minus n over 6. So it's uh, 2 to the n over 6. OK, so th this is what you get. And this is, uh, you, this is better than the, uh, these parameters are better than the basic algorithm. Remember, the basic algorithm had time 2 to the 2 n over 3 and s equals 2 to the n over 3. Right, and now we're doing it with, two, with space of 2 to the n over 6. OK, so it's a very simple algorithm. Uh, but it allows you to uh, kind of uh, improve the space complexity. Those out, but uh... I mean, a priori, you care about minimizing the time, right? Uh, I, mean, I, I want to do the optimal time. I mean, I mean yeah, it's not, it's not obvious uh, but, that. Uh, I mean, I mean, right. in retrospect, it's. Uh, yeah, you know. I mean, if you look at it, it may be, it may be clear, but uh, it's not obvious because the uh, uh, kind of the clamping uh, through pre-computation technique, it kind of gives you a time memory trade-off. So you, you intuitively, you think you maybe you you will lose something in time, but apparently because the steps of the of you know the basic algorithm that I described were not uh, balanced, and then this kind of allows you to balance the space. I mean, uh, you think about you can think about it as uh, you know using more uh, space in the first phase, but losing time. But the first phase was not uh, the bottleneck in terms of time, of, of terms of time complexity. And the second step, you optimize it uh, using more space. Uh, so you kind of balance the steps, and actually you get uh, you get something better. Yes. So a question about the, the strategy here. What does it mean exactly to find the solution in the three tables using the basic 3XOR? Is it, so you use the basic 3XOR algorithm, but on a reduced domain space of only the inputs that were in the tables that you built, or? So, so I'm using the, uh, so basically what I'm doing here, I'm, I have this table T1, T1 that I built, and I'm uh, uh, basically iterating over uh, the domains of, uh, uh, of uh, these two tables, and for each uh, uh, element in the joint domain, uh, and there are two to the n over three such uh, elements, I'm just checking this condition on the table T1. Okay, so that's ba basically the, the basic algorithm for tweaks or that I described previously, but now it's applied to like kind of smaller tables, or you can think of these tables as functions if you want, uh, doesn't really matter. So a reduced search space over the prefixes that you it's it's a reduced uh, domain yeah. like uh, previously the domains were larger like it, they were applied directly to kind of uh, these domains and now the domains are smaller so the complexity is also smaller. Uh, time thanks. Complexity is also smaller. Other questions? Okay. Is there a W here? Yeah. Oh, it's a uh, it's uh, Wang. I, I forgot the uh, I, I forgot. He was a student, I think, PhD student at the time. I, I forgot the first name. Uh, yeah. 
No, so not not a crypto person. No, no, it's a, it's an algorithms uh, conference. Cool. Oh. Pretty cool. Wow. Okay, and there's a variant of the okay. So the analysis we already did, so I'm going to skip over it. Uh, there's actually a variant of the algorithm where you don't need to build three tables. You kind of there's an uh, kind of a, an unbalanced variant here where you instead of building table T3, you just uh, instead of building the table, you directly look into uh, T1 and T2. But yeah, it's uh, just a variant of the algorithm. Uh, uh, like I said, like the, if you remember at the beginning, the basic algorithm that I described you with uh, F1 and F2 for two, two, so you can do it with two tables and you could do it with one table. And here you can remove one table, for, but for, uh, in terms of complexity, it remains the same. I mean, uh, uh, the, the parameters that you get uh, are roughly the same. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so. I talked about uh, Twixor in the regime of uh, uh, m equals uh, n over 3. So now uh, let's see what we can do when we increase the, uh, the domain size. Okay, so this so, is the uh, best known? This, so? is a, this is still the best known in this regime? Yeah, Th that's the best known algorithm for, these, for the parameter of uh, m equals n over 3. That's kind of the single solution regime. The, for this, that's what uh, th this is the best known algorithms in terms of uh, times. Time is, is there a conjecture? What is the time space trade off for this? So basically, we cannot reduce time below two to the turn of a three, no matter. Yeah, and then what space, space. I don't know. Maybe you can do better. Maybe not. But again, you cannot prove anything. Okay. Yes. Anything interesting? Um, yeah. No, but there is, is a conjecture. So basically, you're saying one conjecture would say the time is 2 to the 2n over 3, so no matter what space. It's yeah, just there is a, f I mean, the, you can conjecture the that, 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 that's uh, yeah, famous, related to the famous uh, three sum conjecture. You can also, right. I mean, there's a variant of this right. conjecture applied to Frixor. I don't right. think there's a conjecture, not a famous conjecture regarding the space, but I think it would be, I mean, if you can improve the space here, it would be very interesting. But there is a natural, but there is some natural trade-off from n over 6 to 1, right? There is some natural trade-off. No, there's no uh, trade-off here, uh, beca because we just reduced the space without uh, reducing no, but I mean, time. So we, can, uh, we can have an uh, algorithm in time, I guess, 2 to the Oh, you can increase n. the time and reduce the space, right. right. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, uh, yeah, I'm not uh, focusing on trade-offs here. Right? Uh, like I said, I'll, I'll basically fix uh, like the optimal time and show you how to yes. reduce the space. Okay. But yeah, there are all range of trade-offs that you can do here. Uh, but I don't have time to discuss everything. But there is no conjecture about. I'm just curious if people stated the conjecture. So no, they, I don't, I don't think. The, I, I'm not aware of. Uh, there is no like belief of the community that this is optimal curve, right? You're uh, saying you don't know. I don't know any explicit. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. uh, conjecture, but uh, yeah. Uh. Okay, so uh, let's uh, see what happens when you increase the domain size of the functions. So now, where uh, the domain size is, is larger, it's uh, n over two. Okay, so um, the first thing to note is that we have uh, a lot of solutions on average. So the expected number of solutions in this case, um, this is just the formula that I uh, show. The, uh, the beginning is 2 to the 3, it's k, and now it's 3, uh, k times uh, n over 2 minus n. So it's 2 to the n over 2. So there are many solutions uh, on average. And uh, and now we can actually optimize the time, and we can find uh, uh, one of them more efficiently uh, than for m equals uh, n over 3. OK, so uh, there, are, there, are, there are several algorithms uh, that uh, can do this. And let's first see the Folklore algorithm, uh, which is really simple. So the Folklore algorithm uh, does the follows, uh, does, uh, works as follows. So we fix any input to the third function. F3, and we'll, we'll just define T uh, fix uh, T, which is uh, F3 applied to X3. Okay, and now uh, we actually have a Tuxor problem in the single solution regime because uh, uh, M is equal to N over 2, so we expect, I mean, once we have fixed uh, uh, the input to the third function, we expect that there will be a solution uh, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, equation. Uh, with the uh, inputs uh, from F1 and F2, and then we essentially just solve uh, Tuxor. Okay? 
uh, and well, the time complexity is the time complexity of Tuktor. It's uh, two to the two n, and the space complexity is uh, uh, t uh, sorry two to the n over two, and the space complexity is again it's Tuktor. It's s equals two to the n over two. So we essentially reduced this to Tuktor in the single solution regime. Yeah, that's what we did. We didn't do anything too interesting here. Any questions? Okay, but uh, I mean, now it's not surprising. S can be improved. You can do better. Uh, and uh, the thing to notice is that you can apply a variant of the, uh, of the previous algorithm. Uh, in the single solution regime, you can uh, define a variant uh, where you have many solutions. And it will reduce the space of this, uh, this Folker algorithm. So this is the algorithm. It's, a, it's actually kind of really the same algorithm that we did before. OK, the thing here is that, uh, OK, the, the parameters are different. The, like the prefixes before were n over 6. Now they're n over 4. Um, but uh, besides that, the algorithm is exactly the same. The only thing here that, uh, that changes is instead of like work, uh, iterating over all uh, prefixes t1 and t2, now we're fixing them to some fixed values. OK, so we fix t1. It's uh, n over 4 bit prefix. And t2, it's an n over 4 bit prefix. And now we're doing the same. We're building that kind of the table, this restricted table for f1, restricted table for f2, restricted table for f3. And then we apply a standard quick sort to this restricted table. That's, uh, that's the algorithm, simple variant of the previous one. OK, and, and the first thing that we should check, at least on average, that we, uh, that we actually, uh, I mean, we're expected to, to actually output the solution. And why is that? Well, once we fix t1 and t2, we kind of fixed uh, you know, uh, two strings we kind of restricted the solution space by uh, 2 to the minus n over 4 uh, times 2 to the minus n over 4, because this is, these are the length of these prefixes. OK, so we kind of uh, restricted the solution space by 2 to the n over 2. And we had 2 to the n over 2 solutions to begin with. So on average, uh, actually, we still remain with one solution. OK, so basically. Uh, I mean, at least on average, you still need, you still need to prove that, the, uh, I mean, using some uh, standard techniques that the uh, solution exists uh, with high probability. But uh, yeah, uh, just assume this. Um, and what is the complexity? Uh, well, you can see, again, it's kind of repeating the same analysis that we did before, uh, but uh, with larger domains. Uh, so you can see that the complexity of building each one of the tables is 2 to the n over 2, and also the complexity of the three XOR, uh, of the basic three XOR algorithm applied to the smaller tables is uh, 2 to the n over 2. So the total complexity is 2 to the n over 2, but the space complexity is reduced from the previous basic uh, two XOR algorithm. Uh, it's reduced from 2 to the n over 2 to 2 to the n over 4. Okay, so... Uh, so n over 6 disappeared somehow, it got replaced by n over 4, it just somehow turns out the optimal? It's, uh, uh, yeah, I can do the, the same right. analysis I here. I mean, it's kind of trivial. I'm, I'm not going to repeat sure. it. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, we're not doing anything beyond what we did with the, right. this basic algorithm. The only thing that we did is we fixed, uh, because the domains are larger, we can actually fix these, uh, these prefixes. And it turns out that, uh, yeah, you get this complexity. There, there's nothing. Uh, really special going on here, uh, beyond the fact that uh, we, uh, you know, you should check that uh, uh, are indeed expected to, uh, to output the solution. I mean, is there something special about n over two as opposed to 0.6 n? So, some who for any for anything greater than n over three, there will be some kind of uh, trade-off, uh, or is there something special yeah, yes, about n over two? There is a trade-off. You can uh, actually okay. have it in. Uh, okay. I'm not sure that I'll get to it, but uh, now. Uh, I mean, my plan was to talk about application. Yeah. Not sure that uh, sure. I have time. Maybe I'll, I'll do it this afternoon. But uh, yeah, uh, there is obviously a trade-off between. So there is nothing special about n over two. M over three. 
there's no, no, nothing special. Maybe application, but it's just, I say, I just the, was curious. It's, it's a variant of this algorithm. Right. Uh, uh, so you just chose a particular point to see what happens. Yeah, it's I, not I, really something I, yeah, magical. Yeah, I presented two points. I, see, I, see. I mean, the, it's not an arbitrary point because you cannot do a better, uh, I mean, even if the uh, M is larger than two to the, uh, than N over two, then we don't know how to do better than this. Okay, that is, these are not arbitrary points. These are kind of the two uh, extreme points of the trade-off. Uh, and you can connect them with the line, but uh, yeah, that's uh, basically that's it. Okay, any questions? So how much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Is um, so I think I'll, I'll start uh, talking about the application and then I'll... Uh, uh, in the afternoon, I'll continue, uh, but yeah, I'll, I think I'll start. So something interesting happened. If I look at the point, so in the unique regime, the time was more, but the space was less. Now yeah. there is non-unique regime. You increase the space, but reduce the time some. So I, I'm trying, uh, so like the basic uh, regime here that I'm uh, working with is as I try to optimize the time. And given the optimal time, I'm trying to optimize the space. Yeah. Okay, so if, if, I, if I settle here for, uh, two, for t equals uh, n, uh, 2n over 3, like in the previous regime, then I, get, uh, then I can actually do this with small space. But uh, like I said, I'm uh, focusing on optimal time. Okay, so uh, uh, I won't obviously finish uh, discussing this application, but I'll start and uh, I'll continue this afternoon, so I'll talk about the GA1 and the GA2. Um, so it's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a big context switch, context, uh, switch from algorithms to, you know, to cryptography and cryptanalysis and everything, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's do it. Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, the, um, the background here is a GPRS, so a G GPRS is basically uh, short for a general uh, packet radio service. Uh, it's basically a protocol standard for a mo mobile, a mobile da data standard. It's used for, uh, it was used, uh, I should say, for uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, transmitting uh, email or internet uh, connections over uh, mobile. So it was used in the early 2000s. Um, was established by the European Te Telecommunication Standard Institute. And uh, uh, encryption was uh, protect. Uh, I mean, encryption was used to protect the uh, uh, from eavesdropping. Okay. And uh, initially, uh, the standard used uh, two proprietary stream ciphers, GA1 and GA2. And uh, this, the design of the stream ciphers was hidden. I mean, uh, it was not known until recently, and uh, like last year. TeoraCrypt 2001, this was this uh, very nice paper with the eight authors, and it presented the first uh, public analysis of the deciphers. Okay, and actually it, uh, it was the first uh, disclosure of the specification of the ciphers. Okay, so um, basically the ciphers have a 64-bit key. So it's, uh, it's kind of... Uh, Small now. Uh, I mean, in the early 2000s, it was also small, but uh, maybe, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but l less, uh, less trivial than now, but uh, still, I mean, uh, uh, like I said, they were widely used uh, at that time, at least. Um, but interestingly, uh, for GA1, so uh, this paper uh, that I mentioned, uh, they uh, described a weakness that showed out to recover the 64 bit session key. And time complexity two to the 40 instead of two to the 64, uh, and they used uh, kind of a lot of space, uh, like 65 gigabytes or something like that, um, and it required, uh, I mean, the, the attack required, uh, I mean, uh, not a lot from the eavesdropper. I mean, you just need to, to uh, kind of eavesdrop uh, to the communication, and uh, it doesn't need. I mean, the, the eavesdropper really needed. Uh, to know maybe a 65 bit of known plain text and it's essentially not very difficult to to uh, to apply this uh, I mean to obtain this knowledge in practice okay uh, and the weakness uh, that uh, 
they uh, uh, disclosed uh, is actually believed to be intentional and uh, uh, intentionally hidden by the designers. And this is because some export regulations on cryptography were in place when the uh, cipher was designed. It was in 1998. Okay, and actually uh, uh, the EETSI already pro prohibited the implementation of GA1 in 2013 because there, there was some uh, uh, um, analysis which were not uh, entirely public, but there were kind of rumors that the cipher was not uh, very secure. But, uh, uh, but actually, this, uh, the authors uh, noticed that uh, mobile phones still supported GA1 uh, in, I mean, last year. Uh, this was not supposed to happen. Um, and actually, the, uh, this, uh, this uh, I mean, the, this algorithm was not supposed to be used, even if uh, the phone supported it. But it turns out that, uh, I mean, just by some hacking, you can probably, I mean, apply some maybe downgrade attack. Uh, uh, between the, I mean, uh, kind of uh, um, force the mobile phone and the base station to maybe, uh, you know, downgrade the protocol uh, by some hacking and maybe use this algorithm. Okay, so that's the danger. And, uh, and actually this was, uh, you know, it's not good that uh, mobile phones actually implemented this, uh, until, uh, this, algorithm, uh, this algorithm until a year ago. But hopefully, hopefully it is fixed by now and modern uh, phones do not implement it uh, anymore. Okay, so what, what I'll do, uh, I mean, I'll start now and I'll finish this afternoon. I'll talk about the, the attacks, uh, like the weakness of the attacks, and we'll see that the uh, attacks kind of use the kind of the basic uh, Freaks or uh, and Tuxor algorithms that I uh, just described. Okay. So the attack of uh, this paper on the on GA1 was based uh, basically a, t a Tuxor attack. Okay, and uh, uh, we like the, the paper is coming up in, Euro in EuroCrypt uh, 2022. Uh, we actually show how to reduce the memory. Remember the memory was uh, to, like 45 gigabytes, and we show how to reduce it to uh, to roughly uh, four megabytes, so it's almost trivial, uh, by uh, t using basically the three sort techniques that I just described. Okay, so uh, it's kind of interesting because now the attack uh, trivially runs on a laptop uh, in two and a half hours, uh, and previously it was, uh, I mean, just because the, the heavy memory consumption, it was run on a cluster. I mean, it was still practical, but it was uh, uh, implemented on the cluster. Now you can actually implement it on a laptop. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, this might sound absolutely stupid, but if we, if it's possible to have a four XOR attack, would it be more efficient than four megabits? Sorry. So, when you moved from two XOR to Four to three XOR, the attack was much more efficient. Would it yeah. be possible if a four XOR attack was? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're talking about four XOR. Uh, uh, I didn't talk about four XOR. I uh, plan to do it this afternoon. Okay. So okay, uh, thanks. I, I'm just talking about the application for two XOR and three XOR. So I described the algorithms. I'm talking about the application and four XOR. Hopefully, we'll see this afternoon. Okay, that's the plan. Okay, so uh, let's see a bit about uh, how the cipher is built. I mean, there are not uh, many details here. Uh, there are just a few details that I need to, uh, to describe before I kind of, uh, I, wa I want, uh, I just, just a couple more slides uh, with, uh, you know, with the details of how GA1 is, uh, uh, is built and, uh, and then we'll probably finish because uh, yeah, time is up. Um, so the initialization, uh, so f first the cipher is initialized. So uh, the uh, inputs to the initialization phase are 64-bit session key and 32-bit uh, 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 IV. So it's just a string. Uh, and actually, GPRS uh, 
works in packets, and uh, there's a fixed size for each packet, and for each packet, you encrypt it with a different IV. Okay, so that's the input to the initialization process. And uh, there are basically two steps in the initialization. I'm not going to describe them in detail because it's not very important. Uh, I'm just going to describe them at a high level. So uh, first, uh, the 64-bit key and the 32-bit IV are going to, uh, you apply some function to them and it's going to compute the 64-bit uh, seed. That's the first phase. Uh, and the second phase is, uh, is basically this 64-bit uh, seed is going to uh, initialize the initial state of the stream cipher, which is a 96-bit uh, state. Okay, so uh, there's some mapping. Uh, actually, it's a linear mapping from uh, the seed, which is of length 64 bits, to the 96-bit initial state. So that's, the, I think, the final thing that I'll do. Uh, I think time is up anyway. So the initial state So there are three registers. Like they're written here, uh, I mean they're given uh, on the slide, but maybe it's a bit complicated because th there's, there are other uh, notations here and so forth. So, so there are basically three registers, A, B, and C. The length of this uh, register is 31 bits. The length of this register is 32. And th this register is 33 bits. So overall, the uh, the state here is of size uh, 96 bit. Okay, so and there's a there's a linear mapping uh, that maps between seeds and uh, and this initial state. Okay. So I'll just uh, uh, do one more slide, and, I, and I'll explain this weakness. So already I can uh, kind of, uh, in two minutes, explain what is the weakness, and then we'll see some attacks in the afternoon. Okay? So I won't even tell you how, uh, how to produce keystream. It's not, uh, I mean, it's important later to see the attack, but uh, now I'll just explain to you what is the weakness, and then we'll later we'll see how to exploit it. So I'll just skip some slides. So the weakness is in the initialization process. So like we said, we have two stages. The first computes the 64-bit seed, and the second uh, computes from the seed a 96-bit state, okay, using a linear map. And the weakness is, uh, is kind of, <laughs> you know, interesting weakness. So we look at the joint state of uh, these two registers, A and C. So the joint state is 64 bits, right? So there's 31 bits here and uh, 33 bits here. So apparently, it turns out that uh, the joint uh, state of A and C, it's, uh, it should, in, in general, obtain all, I mean, 64, uh, 2 to the 64 values. But apparently, the weakness is in this map from uh, 64 linear map from 64 bits to 96 bits. Uh, so apparently, it can obtain only 2 to the 40 values out of, uh, uh, theoretically, 2 to the 64 possible. Okay, and, and that's kind of an uh, in interesting weakness um, because it will allow us, uh, uh, I mean, as we'll see, I mean, after in the afternoon, it will allow us to kind of do a meet in the middle or uh, uh, tooks or attack where, where one side will just iterate over the, I mean, internal states of B, so there are 2 to the 32, and the other side of the attack will iterate over all possible, I mean, uh, uh, values of the registers A and C. So they are only 2 to the 40. Okay, so and, uh, and the time complexity is going to be dominated by the large uh, part of the attack, which is 2 to the 40. Okay, so this gives you basically a 2 to the 40 attack. You still need to, store, uh, uh, to do a lot of memory because the TUXOR, remember, uh, the memory complexity will be dominated kind of uh, the, the smaller side of the attack. So uh, it's a number of uh, kind of uh, internal states here, which is 2 to the 32. So it still requires a lot of memory. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll do these things uh, more uh, formally after the, uh, I mean, uh, in the afternoon. But th that's kind of the, the basic ideas. And we'll see how to optimize the, the memory using some uh, uh, variants of the algorithms that I described. Okay, so basically that's a plan. Any questions?